Hello and welcome to a new edition of HL Explain with your host Dr. Mario Topes Rodrigo and today we're going to be talking about bioreactors and how they can be used to address some of the most pressuring challenge on the 21st century. This is the third video of a series that we dedicated to bioreactors and whereas the first two ones focused more on theoretical aspects of bioreactors such as the history or the design of bioreactors, this one is going to focus more on applications. And what do you, what I mean by critical is that even in 2020, the United Nations gathered and decided to publish a document in which they highlighted how critical the situation is. And they wrote 17 points in which the humanity needed to improve in order to achieve a better, um, safer and healthier world. Obviously, bioreactors are not going to be able to be important players in all of, this, of, of these issues, but at least there are three of them in which bioreactors can be critical players. And the ones I'm going to highlight are number three, which is good health and well-being, number six, which is clean water and sanitation, and number 13, climate action. And we know that bioreactors have changed a lot over time, Whereas 10,000 years ago, when uh, they were first invented and they were just a clay pot used to ferment things such as rice, or honey or grape juice to generate sake, meat or wine. On this time, on these 10,000 years, they have changed radically and nowadays they look like this. They are very complex machines such as BioExplorer, manufactured by HL, and they they have moved also the applications and they don't only are used to produce fermented products but also things such as biofuels or drugs such as penicillin. So if you're interested in this we have another video in which we focus about the history of bioreactors. So let's see now how bioreactors can help with these issues. So uh, the first one I want to highlight is climate change. And we know that um, climate change is due to global warming. And global warming is the result of accumulation of certain gases on the atmosphere. Some of these gases can be CO2 or methane or nitrous oxide. And the way that bioreactors can help to address this problem is that, for example, we have things such as photobioreactors. Photobioreactors are bioreactors that are designed to be able to let light in or they have light sources to allow the growth of photosynthetic organisms. And what photosynthetic organisms do is that they use the energy accumulated in light to get some of the CO2 that is on the atmosphere and fix it into their organic matter. So you can clearly see where the relation is here. So using bioreactors, we can increase the efficiency in which this CO2 is going to be scavenged from the atmosphere and is going to be accumulated in organic matter. But the thing is that it doesn't end there because this organic matter actually has some applications. So for example, uh, bioreactors that are used to produce organisms such as spirulina, then can be used to feed both humans and also animals. Methane, on the other hand, can also be improved by the use of bioreactors. And the way that this works is um, most, well, like 20% of all the methane that is uh, released to the atmosphere every year comes from cattle. It comes from ruminants that are animals that when they graze are going to ferment the plants that they ingest in the stomachs and they are going to result in the production of methane. However, there is a growing body of research trying to grow artificial meat in labs. And if we are able to have lab grown meat, then that means that we are going to be not as reliant in having stabled um, animals that are going to be producing this gas. And if, therefore, we're going to reduce the production of methane that is going to go to the atmosphere. And this is going to link to the next slide and this is sustainability and food production. We talked about cattle already and lab grown meat but also um, there is another very big uh, producer of methane every year and this is rice paddies. 
What happens with rice paddies is that we have to inundate large proportions of land to grow rice. And when we have inundated land, uh, their own microbial activity on, at the bottom of, of the water uh, is going to deplete oxygen and this oxygen depletion is going to result in anaerobic processes happening and one of these processes is going to be methane production. So again, if we are able to move away from the production of, of plants using inundated land, then we are going to be able to reduce the production of um, methane that is going to go to the atmosphere. But also monoculture, so like for example we talked about rice paddies, but also we have other types of monoculture, so single species um, um, cultures. And I'm going to give an example that uh, hits very close home. I'm, I'm Spanish myself. And if you go to the south of Spain, especially to the province of Jaén, um, the, the, most of the land there is just used for a single type of, of plant. And in this case, it's olive trees. Jaén is the biggest olive oil producer in the world. Uh, what happens when we have single species is that the, the soil is going to be used very intensively and is going to result on the depletion of nutrients in this soil. This is very concerning because then it means that it is much more prone to be washed away when it rains and therefore processes such, such as desertification are going to be worsened by this. So using bioreactors to produce some of the, um, of the substances that these plants can do are going to result in a better utilization of, 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 of land and therefore is going to reduce processes such as desertification. Another one I want to highlight is biofuel production. And until recently, most of the fuels used for vehicles or for machines derived from oil. However, using bioreactors, we can produce biofuels. And there are two types of organisms that are going to be the main players on, on this kind of, of biofuel production. One of them is fermentative microbes, such as Clostridium or Saccharomyces. And these, one, these organisms are going to break um, carbon sources, such as sugars, to produce molecules such as butanol or ethanol that can be used as biofuels. But also microalgae can uh, accumulate lipids on the um, on their cells and they accumulate huge amounts of these oils these oils then can be transformed industrially into some of the biofuels and this again is going to be like a double a double sword here in one hand we're going to be removing co2 from the atmosphere and on the other one we're going to be producing biofuels waste management is also something where bioreactors can be great players at. So until quite recently, um, most of waste management consisted of getting the waste and dumping it into landfills. The problem with this is that then the microbial activity can uh, break down the, the trash, especially the organics in the trash, and then is going to be mixed, generating liquids. And these liquids can travel inside of the soil, they can percolate, reaching water reservoirs, therefore contaminating them and resulting in, for example, pollution of aquifers, and at the end of the day, can affect human consumption. However, how can bioreactors play in this is, we have modern waste management plants, like just the one that you can see at the bottom of this slide. And these two big green containers that you can see on the right hand side of the picture are actually huge bioreactors. And the way this, that these bioreactors work is we're going to have the organic matter from the waste management plant and it's going to be put into these bioreactors. And organisms that are going to be present there have the ability to break organic matter, especially complex organic matter, into more simple organic matter that other organisms will be able to use. Then other organisms can ferment these smaller products and they are going to be generating things such as organic acids and acetate, but also hydrogen and carbon dioxide and CO2. And then methanogenic archaea can transform the CO2 and hydrogen and this acetate and organic acids into methane. And you might be thinking, yeah, Mario, but you said that methane is bad. No, I didn't say that methane is bad. 
uh, the, the, the uncontrolled release of methane to the atmosphere can be quite dangerous. But if we are able to produce this methane in very controlled atmospheres, such as by a bioreactor, then we can actually use this methane. And if you think of biogas, biogas, 60 to 70 percent of the biogas is methane, like the biogas that we use to warm our houses or to cook. So again, we are generating very useful products using trash for this. So we are, we are turning trash into treasure. Also by your reactors, and this is the last application I'm going to be talking about, um, can be very important players in clean water production. So if we have that raw sewage, so untreated sewage is released to the rivers, we're going to have situations as the, as the pictures you can see on the right hand side. So the bottom one is aesthetically just very disgusting. It's just a lot of brown water, potentially it's going to be very smelly water, but also what can happen there is that there's going to be pathogens. So if that water is consumed, it can end up in food poisoning of humans. But that's not the only problem with uh, raw sewage. Also, raw sewage is very rich in nutrients. Nutrients such as organic matter, but also um, nitrogen products and phosphorus products. And nitrogen and phosphorus are very limiting factors for life. Normally, is what controls the amount of organisms that can be in an ecosystem. So if we have a massive input of these elements, we can have what we call um, algal blooms. So in water, when you have a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, this can result on an overgrow of photosynthetic organisms such as algae or cyanobacteria. And you might be thinking, oh, but that's good because then these photosynthetic organisms can just withdraw some of the CO2 and generate organic matter. And a priori that seems quite a good thing. But the problem is that because of the huge amount of nutrients that can be on this, on this system, we're going to have very thick algal mats. And the problem is in the moment you have a thick mat, the light is not going to be able to reach to the bottom of the mat, resulting on the algae that are on the top dying. And when they die, they are going to just sink to the um, bed of the river. The problem then is going to be that we have a lot of organic matter that is being deposited on the bottom of the river. And the organisms that are going to be there feeding on that organic matter are going to be consuming oxygen, resulting in anaerobic conditions. And one of the problems with this is that is there is any kind of aerobic life around that, such as fish or amphibia, they are going to suffocate and they are going to die again, going to the bottom of the river, making this vicious circle even more. Also, the problem is we've mentioned before what happens when we have anaerobic conditions is the produce of certain gases, such as methane, that are going to make um, things such as global warming even worse. What is the solution for this, um, for the production of clean water? Well, you can use bioreactors such as membrane bioreactors. And the way the, the membrane bioreactors work is we're going to have like two parts in the reactor. One of them is going to be the bioreactor itself where the biochemical reactions are going to be happening. So we are going to have organisms that are going to be feeding in organic matter. They're going to be degrading pollutants and they're going to be transforming nitrogen products such as ammonia into nitrogen gas that is going to escape. Or phosphorus can be also be accumulated inside of certain cells. The second part of the bioreactor, what is going to be is a membrane, it's going to be a filter that is going to prevent any kind of cells from escaping from the bioreactor. And what is going to happen there is if we have any pathogens or we, we have any cells that have been accumulated, phosphorus are going to be removed before leaving the plant. And therefore, the water is going to be clarified and then it can be transferred into rivers without uh, provoking any kind of ecological issue. So the messages I want you to take from this is that um, there are a number of pressing global issues to the point that the United Nations have to pronounce themselves about it. Bioreactors, because they sit very nicely in the interface between biology and engineering, can actually be easily modified to address some of these issues, which is the third point that I wanted to make 
today and um, this is it from me thank you very much for listening and if you have any comments or any questions please reach out to us my name is dr mario Tobias rodrigo and i am the applications leader at hel thank you very much